Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the first of our 8.30 fall services, and we're back and wearing uh, full vestments, so uh, a little different from the summertime. I want to welcome everybody to worship at um, 8.30. Uh, the announcements I have this week are we are going to be starting confirmation this week. It'll start, it'll be from 8.30 to, or no, 6.30 to 8.30, 6.30 to 8.30. On Wednesday, the first half an hour will be a parent meeting with the parents, and we will also have Living with Loss at 10 a.m. on Friday. Are there other announcements that I need to give? Okay, if not, let's start right into the service and go into the brief order of confession and forgiveness. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are bodies to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may be light in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
O oh Lord God, merciful judge, you are an inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. Jacob's death, the brothers of Joseph begged for forgiveness for the crime they had done against him. You intended to do me harm, Joseph said, but God used this as an opportunity to do good and save many lives. A reading from Genesis, the 50th chapter. Realizing that their father was yet dead, Joseph's brothers said, what if Joseph, Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intend to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people, as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. The word of God. Thank you. The Christian community has significant struggles with diversity. Here, Paul helps us understand that despite different practices in worship and personal piety, we do not judge one another. All Christians belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for all of us and will judge each of us. A reading from Romans, the 14th chapter. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat. For God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on the servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord, and those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lives again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or why do you despise your brother or sister? For we all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel information. sins against me. How often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, seventy times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. 
When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children, and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he should pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. And you may be seated if there's any children that would like to come down. Usually they usually come from different countries or a long time ago, but do you want to hear one more recent from the, from the United States, an older uh, story from the United States? It doesn't matter whether you say yes or no, I'm going to tell it anyway. <laughs> but I appreciate the non yes. So, well anyway, I want to tell you a story that's, uh, and let me see, I'm, uh, I may need Peyton to give me the first screen on this. There we go. It's actually about two farmers who live side by side. They were brothers. And they got it along very well. They did everything together. Um, and they planted and harvested together. They were always there to help. Uh, one time, though, they got in, into a little bit of an argument uh, because uh, their father had passed away and they left a little piece of land and nobody really knew how much to get, get how much land. And then they stopped speaking uh, to each other. So they started to do everything pretty much by themselves. And they didn't really have much to do with each other. And so when this happened, when they didn't get along for a long time, uh, their land was separated by a little, a, a creek. Do you call it a creek or a stream? Uh, you know, a little bit like a small river. A stream? Do you call it a stream too? We call it both a stream or a creek. But it was, their property was divided. But one of the brothers said, I don't even want to see my brother. I don't even want to look at him. So there was a man who was very good at carpentry. And he was around there, and he had his own crew. And he said, you know what? I don't even want to look at my brother's land anymore. I want you to build a high fence between my land and my brother's land. Even though the creek divides us, I don't even want to see him. So could you, out here they are, they're not getting along anymore. They're fighting there. But could you build a fence for us? And could you build a fence so that I don't have to see my brother? And he says, I'm going away. I have some business out of town. I'll be gone for a while. You and your crew can work. I'll come back, and I'll pay you. So he goes away, and he expects to come back and see this fence that's built so high that he won't have to see his brother. But the carpenter did something very different. Let's see. There we go. He built a bridge. And when the farmer who had the carpenter build the fence came back and saw there was no fence, but there was a bridge there, instead he got very upset. And just as he was about to yell at the carpenter, his brother came running over the bridge. 
and said, thank you for finally building that bridge. I've missed you when he hugged his brother. And they made what we call amends. They forgave each other. Do you know what forgiveness is? It's kind of when you wipe the slate clean of anger, right? And that's what he did. And when that happened, uh, they became brothers again and acted like brothers again. And the one farmer was going to pay the carpenter for building the bridge even when he realized it was the better building, uh, but he disappeared. Now that's kind of an American story. I usually tell, uh, it's an American folk story. I usually tell when I eat up bagels or that, but I like this one because it reminds me of the Bible story that we have today where, I'm going to have to see if, yeah, and there the brothers are. There we go. Um, and Peyton, I might require, I may have to do my finger with you today if, if my flipper isn't working. Um, but it reminds me a little bit of uh, the story that we hear in the Bible today. We have a, a man named Joseph, and his brothers don't like him because his dad, well, kind of favors him. He gives, him, he gives Joseph the nicer stuff, like a, a real nice coat that has a lot of different colors. And his brothers send him off to a whole different country. But he does very well for himself in that other country. And eventually his brothers need to come to him. Uh, and get some food because uh, there's something called a famine and there's not enough food around. And do you think, do you know what Joseph does? Does anyone know the story about Joseph? Does he give him the food or does he say, sorry? Yeah, he gives him the food. And then they're, they act like brothers again because that's forgiveness. That's forgiveness that uh, we give to each other. And we give forgiveness to each other because who forgives us first for what we've done wrong in our lives? Jesus, right, because Jesus forgives us, we're called to forgive others. And I think the story of Joseph, really, even though it was before Jesus lives, shows us that, you know, because God gives us so much, you know, we have to treat others well, and even if that means forgiving them if they've done us harm. So why don't we say a prayer? Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father. fill us with the spirit of forgiveness. Which comes, from which comes from you forgiving us, you forgiving us. Through, Jesus Christ. through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming up. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll see if I'm standing. Hopefully this will work a little bit better, Peyton. If not, I'll have to uh, signal you. But I will need the first picture. You know, if you're looking for good family, biblical values in the Bible. Uh, Genesis probably is going to be a tough place to look for good family values. Uh, because when we look at the book of Genesis, right when we get into the family and we get into the first children, which are Cain and Abel, Cain is already jealous of Abel, and he kills Abel. And we get into God's punishment of Cain, and although God punishes Cain, he doesn't abandon Cain, and then we get, oh, my, it seems like my flipper's working now. All right. We get into other siblings in the Bible that just don't seem to be able to get along too well. We have Isaac and Ishmael. Now, Isaac and Ishmael, uh, I don't think they so much despised each other, but their mothers despised each other. They had the same father, but different mothers. And the Sarah, who was Abraham's original wife, is uh, so upset with Hagar and Ishmael, she feels they're mocking them, that she sends them away from the community. Then we get into people like Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau had the same parents. But mother liked Jacob best, father liked Esau best. And actually, Jacob is going to prevail in order to get uh, the coveted firstborn blessing, which is going to cause problems there. Rachel and Leah, not only were they sisters, they were sister wives. They were married to the same man, which caused tension between the two of them. And their sons, well, they'd have some tension too. And they would eventually sell their brother Joseph into slavery, which is the first lesson which Shelley read today. Joseph was number 11 
of 12 sons. And his story really is about one of the greatest stories of forgiveness in the Old Testament. And he is turned on by his brothers, but he ultimately forgives him. Now, number 11 of, of these sons, he was still number one when it came to Rachel's children. So that's why he was favored. And his father gave him a coat of many colors, which a lot of people know about. There's even musicals about it. But it made the brothers very jealous. He also had the ability to interpret dreams. It was a God-given ability. And with these dreams, he wasn't afraid to brag about them once in a while. And one of his dreams included the fact that his brothers were all going to bow down to him, which made his brothers very angry. And the majority of his brothers wanted to kill him. But two of the brothers, Judah and Reuben, did not want him dead. They didn't want blood on their hands. So they came up with a compromise. And the compromise was to sell him to their distant relatives, the Ishmaelites. And the Ishmaelites, in turn, would sell Joseph to the Egyptians. And he would go from a slave to prisoner when... With his first master, he refused his master's wife's advances. She makes up a lie about him. He goes to prison. But he's still able to interpret dreams. And this eventually catches the attention of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is having some bizarre dreams, including skinny and fat cows, good grain and bad grain. And Joseph is able to interpret those dreams to let the Pharaoh know that their Egypt is going to go through a time of prosperity followed by a time of famine and that you need to prepare for this famine. Now through this interpretation of this dream, Joseph is going to go up in status and become Pharaoh's second-hand man. And the famine is going to hit and Egypt is well prepared for it. But it's also going to affect the surrounding areas which is going to bring Joseph's brothers into the area to get grain. And since Joseph is second in command, he's going to be in charge of this. And he's going to recognize his brothers. His brothers aren't going to recognize him uh, because he has assimilated into the culture. And Joseph's going to play a little game of cat and mouse for a little while, but he's finally going to reveal to his brothers who he is. He's going to forgive them totally invite them and their families to live in the land of Egypt along with their father Jacob, which is a beautiful reunion. The only thing is, as what happens, Jacob dies. When a parent dies, it changes the family dynamics. I think we all know that. You know, I know that as not only a lawyer and a pastor, but I know this as a sibling and a child. You know, just watching my own parents' age. It does change the family dynamic. Sometimes for the good, sometimes for not always so good. But this is what Joseph's brothers are worried about in the first lesson today. Now that dad has died, is Joseph still holding a grudge? Does Joseph want repayment? for all the harm we have caused him. So they say to Joseph, look, before dad died, he had this final request. And this final request was that you, Joseph, forgive your brothers for all the wrong that we have done to you, for all the crimes that have been committed to you. We are servants of the same God as your father served. And when Joseph hears this from his brothers, he starts to cry. And they start to cry. And they bow down before him, just as Joseph had predicted in a dream. And Joseph says, don't be afraid. I, I don't want you to be have any kind of a fear. I'm not taking the place of God here. You may have intended to harm me, but God intended to do good out of this. He intended that through this experience, Egypt would be saved. And I'm still going to provide for you and your children. And he talks to them in a reassuring manner, 
so that they know that Joseph really has forgiven. Now, the story of Joseph in the Old Testament, to me, is probably, you know, the greatest foreshadowing in the Old Testament of the forgiveness that Jesus Christ ultimately gives to us on the cross. And there are some similarities. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was betrayed for how many pieces of silver? 30. Yeah, a little more. I was wondering if that was because of inflation between the Old Testament and the New Testament or the fact that Jesus is the Son of God after all. Joseph forgives his brothers entirely. Jesus forgives humanity entirely. God takes something bad in each case and turns it into something good. He takes the slavery of Joseph and turns it into the salvation of Egypt from this famine. And he takes the crucifixion of Jesus and he turns it into the salvation of mankind. Now, of course, there's differences. Joseph is not the son of God. He cannot die for our sins. Only Jesus can do that. Jesus can only be the one to rise from the dead to break the veil of death. Joseph can't do that. But what Joseph can do as a human being is remind us how we are to respond to God's grace, which includes mercy and forgiveness. And Joseph gives us that perfect example. And then we get into the New Testament Gospel reading today. You know, we're talking about some 1,800 years after... Joseph. And Peter's going to ask Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive a brother or a sister who sins against me? Is it seven times? And Jesus says, no, it's not seven times. It's 70 times seven. Now, my guess is Jesus is not talking about 490 right here. Because if you think of it, if we sin in thought, word, and deed, and our thoughts are totally focused on love of God and love of neighbor. We're going to go through that 490 times pretty quick when it comes to forgiveness. Not only forgiving others, but we're supposed to forgive as God forgives us. And I sure hope God forgives me more than 490 times. And in the parable we get, we find out that we're supposed to forgive as God forgives us. Because we get a parable about a master who has a slave who owes a huge amount of debt that is not even payable in a number of lifetimes, and the master forgives that slave of all that debt. But then that slave finds another slave or servant who owes a very small, microscopic debt compared to what was owed to the master, and he refuses to forgive that fellow slave or servant. And the master isn't happy. And it ends with, well, basically the servant going to prison. <laughs> but we find out what our response is. You know, that in Scripture, in God's economy, God forgives us of much so that we can forgive others. And I always say this, God speaks to us in two ways. In the Scriptures, first and foremost, but also in nature. Uh, Dale Carnegie was an author, he was a public speaker, he was really kind of a pioneer in kind of the self-improvement model. He died in 1955, but in the early 20th century, he used to go out west, and when he went out west, he would go and visit the parks out there. I don't know if they were state or national parks, but he'd go out there and he'd visit the parks. And back then, remember this is the early 20th century, what they would do is, at these parks, they would bring in garbage, and they would let the grizzly bears come and eat the garbage, and then the tourists could watch the grizzly bears eat the garbage. Now, I'm going to be the first to admit in the Upper Peninsula where I'm from, when I was younger, we used to go to the garbage dump and watch the bears eat from the garbage dump. But they were black bears, which were a lot safer, but still, we don't want to pollute the earth. But back then, they did it to get the tourists. But if you had grizzly bears coming in, you also had to have a park ranger there who was armed to protect the tourists from the grizzly bears. So Dale Carnegie is there with a number of tourists and they're watching these grizzly bears eat the garbage, you know, when it gets near dusk. And the park ranger is explaining that the grizzly bear is the most powerful animal in the western hemisphere with the possible exceptions of a Kodiak bear, a polar bear, and a full-grown male bison. 
But outside of those three, the grizzly is on the top. And as he is saying this, a skunk comes and steals food from the grizzly bear. The grizzly bear looks annoyed. And Dale Carnegie is thinking you know, to himself, he knows, he knows about skunks. We all know about skunks, right? What happens when you hit them with a car or anything. You know? The grizzly could get revenge very easy. He could kill the skunk with one blow, you know, probably using uh, one hundredth of its force. But then what would happen? Everything would smell, right? Everything would have a horrific stench. And in Dale's mind, he is reminded that that's what revenge looks like. You know, when you get revenge, everything winds up stinking. Even the one who gets the revenge. So the grizzly bear wisely forgives the skunk and lets the skunk take what he wants and they sit and they eat together and there's enough for both of them and they're in harmony. And that's like Joseph and his brothers. Joseph could have easily quashed his brothers there. When his brothers came looking for grain, he could have had them all put to death. You know, kind of like Cain killing Abel, he could have done, he could have followed that same dysfunctional pattern. But instead he breaks that pattern and he forgives. And then there's harmony between him and, bro and his brothers. And I look at it and is there dysfunction in Joseph's family? Yeah. You know, there's even violence in his family. There's all kinds of horrific things in his family. But there's also the mercy, love, and grace of God there. You know, when I look at, you know, our families, whether we're talking about our family of origin or our group of friends or our community, is there dysfunction? Of course. But is there love, mercy, and grace and forgiveness through God? You bet. Through Jesus Christ. Amen.
drawn together in the compassion of God. We pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. You welcome us when we are weak in faith. Uphold your church throughout the world. Make it a place of welcome. Strengthen faith through Bible studies and Sunday schools, confirmation classes, and youth ministries. Nurture new ministries of education and growth. Lord, in your mercy. The heights of heaven show us the vastness of your steadfast love. Have compassion on your creation. Where humans selfishness has brought to brought and ruined destruction, we look to you to heal, renew, and redeem your world. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Make your ways known to the nations. Speak kindness to our bitter grudges. Settle our hearts when we want to settle accounts with violence. Bless our leaders with patience and wisdom. We especially pray for these service members, Kristen Bartelt, Michelle Traub, Eric Rohr, Sam Ballier, Caleb Gard, and concerns of our world and nation today, including these we name now in our hearts or aloud. The whole our country. COVID. Lord, in your mercy. Bring healing and justice whenever harm is dealt. Provide vindication for all who are oppressed. Free victims of human trafficking and forced labor. Deliver all who are bound by debt. Feed all who hunger and guard refugees fleeing famine, poverty, and war. We especially pray for the family of Linda Miller, Eleanor Knuth, Floyd Freilich, Sally Freilich, and others we name now. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Teach us to forgive. Remind us that you do not always accuse us. Still, our tongues when we are tempted to pass judgment and argue over opinions. Make this congregation a community of mercy for one another and for all our neighbors. We pray for these St. Luke members and their families. Carrie Pellman, Nick and Rachel Powell, Timothy and Denise Ball, Tyler Hine, Tracy Long, Brian and Shauna Lee, Tom and Mary Bauer, Mark and Katie Felker, Jennifer and Paul Mers, Judy Bowes. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Whether we live or whether we die, we are yours. We thank you for those who have showed us faithfulness for the knees that taught us how to bow <coughs> to you and the tongues that taught us to praise you. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Christ our Lord. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. And we will go to the offertory songs, and the offertory plates are in uh, the narthex and over on the side as well.
and gave it to his disciples, saying to them, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. The gifts of God for the people of God. The table has been set, and all are welcome. The body of Christ given for you. 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 May Jesus Christ bless you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. May Jesus Christ bless you now. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you.
Please rise. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace.